Hello, I'm Debbie Kitterman, and welcome to Dare to Hear the Podcast, where we equip you and challenge you to dare to hear the voice of God. Well, I'm excited because I have Amy Rogers back in the studio, and we're going to record not one, but two. This is a two-parter, so we want you to know this is a two-part podcast episode, and uh, it's been a while, and it's just been this crazy season of we haven't had the opportunity. I was sick, and so we're going to talk about Amy's words that the Lord gave her for 2024. Um, and so I'm really excited, but if you have not, um, watched an episode or listened to an episode with Amy Rogers before, let me introduce her to you. So Amy is called to be a prophet to the church to the church of the nations uh, with a Jeremiah 110 mandate to tear down, uproot, to plant, and to build. Amy has been moved to share her journey with absolute transparency through her writing and speaking. And her mission is to speak his life and his love, inviting others in to hear the Lord's heartbeat for themselves. And she has a ministry called Raw and Real Ministry. And she's also got some broadcasts and stuff that will be, we'll just give you all the links to all of those things at the end. But Amy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me again. It's always a joy. <laughs> ah, well, you're so welcome. I'm just that I was like looking back, like, cause we had pre-recorded a bunch of stuff so that, you know, we could have the holidays off. And I was like, huh, I haven't actually had Amy on the podcast for a while. So I was really happy to have you back. And, um, so thanks for taking the time to do that. We're going to talk about a couple of the words that the Lord gave you one. He gave you in October, um, as we changed over with the Hebrew calendar and then one that he gave you as we changed over into the Gregorian calendar of 2024. But before we jump into that, cause I'm going to ask you to read it. So I want to make sure. So the first one is called the threshold, but before you do that, I just want to give just kind of a brief little um, announcement to people that I have uh, two workshop events that are coming up. Um, one is the remembrance workshop. So if you took the dream workshop, you're going to want to sign up for this because there's many of us that have a difficult time moving forward, overcoming obstacles and pursuing all that God has for us, but not anymore. One of the things that if you've heard my word for 2024, one of the words, um, it was remember, recover, restore. And one of the words was remember. And the Lord started talking to me about, we don't remember. And I know some of you might be thinking, well, what do you mean? We don't remember. We're not supposed to remember. God is doing a new thing. Can't we perceive it? Yes, that's part of it. But there are things that we need to remember. And I'm going to talk about that. I have a whole one day event. Um, so you're going to want to go to the website, debbiekitterman.com. You're going to want to sign up for that. It is Saturday, May 4th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. And I'm going to do things a little bit different. Early bird pricing is a really good deal. And then if you uh, can't attend live, you're going to want to get the VIP ticket because that's going to get you access to the recording. I'm not going to give the recording for uh, those of us because it is a live event. I want you joining us live. This is one thing that I recognize from the dream big event was that when you're live, you can interact and it is actually like a live event, like you're sitting right there in the room. And so I'm changing things up a little bit and stepping into a new season and I'm inviting you to come with me. So go check that out on the website. And then if I have any people that are entrepreneurs, authors, um, product product makers. I have a event. It's a three day event. It's called ready to launch. And that is going to be in June and you can find the details of that as well. And right now, um, there is uh, early bird pricing on that three day event as well. And again, there's the VIP ticket with all these little extras that you get, not just the recording, there's extra stuff that you're going to get with this VIP ticket. So go check that out. Okay. So thank you for that little infomercial, Amy, for standing by why I did that. Um, and let's jump into the threshold. This word that the Lord gave you back in October of 2023, because it's so still relevant for where we're at right now. And it really is going to set the foundation for the next word that we're going to talk about on next week's podcast episode. So, yeah, I, I think, um, when we really look at the, the gravity and allow God's timing to kind of be a slow burn for us in our timeline, um, we really see, um, the expanse of his words as he brings them forth and, and the time that he gives it to us, um, is really kind of something to behold, you know, the, the threshold word really kind of was unfolding at a, what, you know, we as humans would consider a slow pace, um, because it really was through the whole year, I kept 
having this visual of this threshold, but it was not like the threshold of a door. It was like, you know, if we're going to bring a biblical story into it, it would have been like the Jordan River, right? This precipice of crossing over into something new and unknown. And I kept having that put before me. And so, you know, when he finally said, okay, this is the culmination of it, I knew that it was something um, very relevant about his timing on that. And so, I think that's, you know, where the word kind of starts off and I'll just kind of jump in and start reading it because he said um, the Hebraic year of 5784 and then our Gregorian year of 2024 is deeper and a new level of this new era. And because we've been in this new era for a while, um, this new era, and it is not what you think. In order to understand what is to come, we have to embrace and shift our perspective of what has been. In past seasons, our travail has been a close confidant. Many have seen this travail as a nuance and our nuisance, not nuance. <laughs> travail as a nuisance instead of a necessity. Many have travailed and held their heartache over what has not come. Our Heavenly Father understands this, but is asking us to expand our visions for what we are heartbroken over. We have to come to an understanding of what is to come. The dreams, promises, and transfers will have a moment and or season of travail with them. This travail may feel like sorrow, but it is the weightiness of the promise. This isn't a quote unquote hope deferred because we understand the lingering here on earth is the appointed time of heaven. And that's a Habakkuk 2-2 uh, reference there. We travail, we war, we stand, we trust, we intercede, we prophesy that appointed thing. Our partnership with God in this current threshold transition is our travail over the greater purpose of what is to come, not for the receipt of things or personal achievement here on earth. It is all for his glory and victory over the seasons we are walking out of, as well as the ones to come. Many travailed over their heavenly wealth transfer. Hannah's was for a son, but the greater vision was a prophet to the nations. Daniel's was for a deeper understanding over what he was shown. Elijah's was for the rain to return after a season of famine. Jeremiah's was for his nation and Jesus's was for all eternity with us in mind. We need to embrace the, tr the blessings of travail in order to hold the blessings of this transitional moment and all the Lord will be bringing to us. And then um, Habakkuk 2.14, where it says the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Throughout this year, the Lord released me to speak about surrendering to his posturing and positioning as I continue to see us approaching this threshold. This surrender has been and will continue to be sacrificial. It must be sacrificial because our flesh and fleshly desires cannot survive in his presence and will not have the capacity to withstand or steward what is to come. This posturing requires not only us not only our surrender and sacrificial obedience, but it also requires repentance, humility, and the reverential fear of God, a recognition of his holiness and his plans rather than our plans and comforts in this earthly realm. We have been in a transitional Psalm 23 journey season, a season of no longer walking in things of this world and our flesh, but fully walking in things of the spirit. I have previously shared about this threshold I have seen approaching. We are standing in it now. I believe the Lord has mercifully extended this moment to give opportunity to those who have resisted what he has requested. However, time marches on and allowing this posturing needs to happen swiftly. This is a threshold of transition into a posture for what is to come. It is a crossing over into a deeper level of this new era we have been in. It is transitioning into dreaming with God. And in all of this, we will be positioned for the heavenly wealth transfer that will come. What does that mean? Your instruction with this word is to get with the Lord and let him tell you what he needs from you at this moment. Be ready and willing to hear what you may not want to hear and do what you may not want to do. This threshold crossing requires purifying. It is the beginning of a Psalm 24 year. 
Um, and then Psalm 24 verses three through four, who may ascend the hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. Our submission and purification will then give way for our ascension onto his holy hill. This wealth transfer isn't in the ascension. It's in the king of glory coming through the gates. We cannot become the gates for the king to come through until we have ascended and we can't ascend until we have clean hands and a pure heart, not one or the other, but both. This purification will remove our ideas of what plans our ideas of our plans of what the promised wealth transfer will look like. We must allow the king to decide. Our king lavishes upon us as he flows and marches through us as his gates. We are no longer building earthly things. We are bu building kingdom provisions for when the na for the nations when the famines come. God is building his storehouses, his voices of healing when pestilence, diseases, and death comes knocking. This wealth transfer is in the healing, harvest, and life that we as his bride will bestow on all in his name. This wealth transfer is the wealth of heaven, the fullness thereof. Those hung up on defining it with earthly systems and measurements have already missed it. And then I'm just going to refer you to go back and read uh, Psalm 24, read it in its fullness. Um, and then the hand of God is also shuffling relationships and connections, relational covenants. There have been many who have come into an agreement of relational covenants, but have not stewarded them with the reverence, honor, or purity in which they were originally created. He is removing the mixture. Just as King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2 placed Daniel in charge over all the other wise men, we have seen this still being played out. The purity of the anointed, or the purity of the appointed Daniels paired up with the counterfeits of worldly influences. The, the King Nebuchadnezzar leaders have seen this pure, yet kept the counterfeits in play. There will be a major upheaval in leadership that has tolerated, celebrated, and promoted mixture. Prideful, entitled, money-motivated spirits have been major contributors in this. We as leaders in our own lives need to make sure we have not paired up the pure with the counterfeit to clean hands and pure hearts in everything. And then um, the next session is war at the threshold. I was given a dream several months ago. In this dream, there was a gate with a cannon at the threshold. The Lord said to me, there is war at this threshold. There will be cannon fire, but the cannon of your praise brings forth the victory. These are not the days to be squeamish or downtrodden at the battle set before us. If we do not armor up and war, we will not be able to withstand what is to come, nor will we be able to steward what heaven desires to bestow upon us. And then Psalm 144, 1, where it says, Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. We are in a revolutionary war. There is revelation pouring from heaven and bursting out from our spirit man, a bold and brave company of believers counting every attack, every blast, every shot from the enemy's camp, counting it all as joy. A revolution of our vision and our thought processes has to come. To those who are already in process, it's coming swiftly. We will see a revolution happen here on this earth and within all its systems. This is why the Lord has been posturing his remnant on the mountains of influence. Those who have not stewarded their mountains, their mantles, and those in high and lofty places will be made low. You will see a dismantling and the scrambling. Some will beg for these things to remain, but this remain the same, but it will not be sustained. As these revolutions come, your faith must remain steadfast in his word. Hebrews 11, 1 and Deuteronomy 11, 1 have been glued together in front of me in this transitional place. Our faith to see what is unseen and the covenant God is fulfilling through us as we partner with him in said covenant, as well as bringing to us. Remember, he is a covenantal and generational God. You may not know what was covenanted to generations before you, but he does. 
he is inviting you to allow him to show you what that is for this generation, for this moment in time, for his glory. And Hebrews 11, one says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And then Deuteronomy 1, 11 is may the Lord, the God, your fathers, your ancestors increase you a thousand times and bless you as he has promised. So good. And I know it was a little long to have you read that, but I think it's so important for people to hear it. And then we'll have the link in, in the um, show notes so they can go directly to this word to read it, to print it out. Because this was five, six months ago when you released it, God had been working on it before because this came out in, in early October of 2023. But even on this side, looking back in the moment, we didn't really know all that was going to happen, but we've seen a lot of some of this play out um, maybe in our own personal lives, but also definitely in the church realm. We've seen some of these things play out and it really um, started at the beginning in January and some stuff was tricky trickling out too at the end of 2023, but things really started to heat up with some of this transition piece. And um, I, I am struck, Amy, by how the Lord had given you this. I was working on my word and then we went into the holidays. And even though this word had come out and then the next word that we're going to talk about for next week's podcast episode, how closely tied they are together, but from different perspectives and different angles. And this is what I think people need to understand is that we can have many different voices speaking, but there's threads throughout them all. It's like we have the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? They were all with Jesus, but they saw from a different perspective, but they weren't in competition with each other, except for maybe John who kept saying that he was the one that Jesus loved the most, right? <laughs> Um, but, and, and I just, I love this because I, I have several things here that I want to talk about that I'm sure people are like, what does she mean by that? And so I want us to unpack that, but I'm struck by this remembrance thing because here at the very end, you're like, we need to remember his covenants that he gave to generations before, because we might not remember. And so it just kind of solidifies to me. It's another thing of the importance of this remembrance, um, workshop that I'm doing, but I want to go back to the very beginning beginning of your word. Um, cause I think that's a great place to start. We could start at the end and we could start talking about some of those things, but I think, I think going to the beginning, um, because I know when we were talking in preparation for this, um, you had said that when the picture you had was like the crossing the Jordan river of, of coming in, but then also at the time, you know, you weren't really thinking about the, um, what 2024 was going to be for the Hebrew calendar. And so I want you to kind of talk a little bit about that because I think it then gives a little more emphasis to this threshold moment that we find ourselves standing in. You're, you're muted. How did that happen? happen. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I, I think it really kind of highlights how God speaks to all of us in different ways. Um, I think if I were to just kind of get a little nugget from him and then just go, oh, well, I need to dig into the Hebrew word and all of these things, you know, like if that was the path he wanted me to go down, he definitely would have led me down that path. But I think um, there's a way that he has each of us look at things. And I've always likened it to um, like a diamond, you know, when you're looking at it and you're turning it around in the light, there's all these different cuts and facets. And why would I want to look at a facet that somebody else is supposed to be looking at? You know, that's that's not where he wanted me. And I think because when we look at the Hebrew number right of the, of the year the 5784 you know the four is delet right it's the door and and in the thought of a doorway didn't come to me because i think the lord although that is true and that is a threshold crossing over with a doorway and that has defined this new hebraic year i think the gravity and and the brevity that the lord really wanted to picture was something more than just maybe walking through a doorway it was something uh, broader and deeper 
like the Jordan crossing over, you know, they were literally moving from one old season of wandering and miraculous provision, um, crossing over into a, a, a land that was promised them, um, not knowing how they were going to get over there, but it really was this wild, um, crossing over, but they also knew that there were giants in that new land. They knew that there was going to be war um, in that new place, but they didn't cross over with intrepidation. Do you know what I mean? And I, so I think the Lord really wanted to picture, like paint that picture. It's, it's bigger than what we just kind of instinctively see. Oh, I want this new door. I want this new opportunity. I think he really wanted to paint the picture from, from my perspective and how he wanted to speak through me um that is much greater than just a quote unquote simple open door and i think that's why he laid it out for me that way and so i think when we take what we've heard not just through me but through other prophetic voices and we lay all of those pieces down on one table you begin to see how he's piecing that together and um and just the the preparation that he did with those israelites as they approached the jordan and then what he did as they crossed over and then we know the story post that as well yeah well and i think i think it's important too because i think i think sometimes we when we hear things like you know when you know, it's the season of the open door that we have a certain context or perspective of what it is, but the way that the Lord gave it to you, like if you think about the crossing of the Jordan river and all that went into it, like it totally, like I can see the basis for a lot of what you were talking about in this word, because before they even crossed over, the people are telling Joshua, be strong and courageous. Don't look to the right or the left. Keep your focus on God. And they repeat it so many times, right? The Lord has to say it to him too. And, and they're reminding him of, look, this is what God's called us to, but it was a reminder for themselves as well, because they really were crossing this threshold. And I think when we think about it and, um, I think we can be inundated especially around the the beginning of the new year right it's this september october for the hebrew calendar and then beginning of january with all the words coming out um that we can be inundated and when, if it was just a doorway that we could somehow make that be smaller than what this threshold word is right because when you're talking about crossing over from one season into a new season from the old into the promises that they that they did not, they ended up wandering in the desert for 40 years because they didn't remember the promises of God and the covenant that God had made, um, all the way back, um, through future generations. And your word talks about that. Um, and so I love this. It was kind of in the first paragraph. I kind of highlighted a couple of things that I want to talk about. Uh, you said we have come to an understanding of what is to come. The dreams, promises, and transfers will have a moment and our season of travail with them. Okay. Nobody wants travail. So let's talk about that a little bit. Why do you think it was important that the Lord is setting the tone for it's not going to be, you know, Oh, the door and you're going to walk through it. Cause one of the things that I said for the, the word for my, the year for me was remember, recover, restore. Well, you don't recover and restore if there's not a battle or if somebody doesn't take something from you. And I think that goes hand in hand with this travail. So talk a little bit about like what was on your heart when, and what is still on your heart with what God is talk, talking about. Yeah, I think um, to kind of sum it all up, I, I the weightiness of what I've really been hearing from the Lord, what I've been kind of walking through myself right it's it's really um without sounding fruity it's really removing more of our flesh and it's really stepping further into um that heavenly stance allowing our spirit man to be more of a deciding factor in our day-to-day -day lives 
And I think um, I've, I've kind of hit this threshold of um, intolerance with what I call the fruity cotton candy, you know, raw, raw stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not denying or debating the goodness of God and the things that he promises, but I have walked enough life and I know the Lord enough to know that with what he is calling us up into is good and great and glorious for him. It does benefit us here on this earth, but I also know that there's a cost to it. And I think so many times in our fleshly knee jerk um, receipt of things, um, in our knee jerk visions of things, our desires to, you know, our flesh loves comfort. Right. And, and, and I'm not ignoring that about myself. I'm not a robot, you know, but there is something deeper within that where I know that every promise has a, a generational thing attached to it that is going to require, um, something from me in order for that thing to, in order for me to walk out for it to be the fullness thereof. Right. And so, you know, like the references that the Lord gave me, like what woman doesn't desire to have a child. Hannah was in this deep travail over this promise. And I mean, call it, you know, having, having a baby for the first time, um, or having, you know, just, just having a child in general or, you know, financial needs or health. I mean, there are people that are dealing with tremendous health problems. That is a promise and, and a uh, miracle that the Lord is saying, yes, it's yours. It's yours. It's yours. Let's, let's intercede. Let's press in. Let's fast. I mean, there is travail, you know, there, there's a, a cost in our tears in order to attain. And, and the Lord's not saying, I'm going to give you this. If you give me this, right? Like, it's not like, um, like a bill collector, right. but, but we understand that heaven doesn't make sense in earthly ways. And I think when we just paint it into the sugar, coded sim simple um i'm just going to walk through this door and all will be right with the world and and not weighing the cost of what the attainment of that is i think we're doing ourselves a great disservice and i think we are diminishing um the fullness that heaven is so desiring to bring through us um and then on on a tertiary end of that, you know, a, a, what heaven wants to bring to us, you know, our receipt of things is really just kind of a byproduct of being willing to allow heaven to work through us and 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 do what God so desires in this moment of time. Yeah. Well, and I think too, I think I think some of us get comfortable, and I think what we're finding is that leaders get so comfortable in their ability to walk in their giftings and their anointings, right? We know that the giftings and callings of God are irrevocable. And so what we see is these leaders that we're shocked and appalled that they're falling, that they had moral sin because they didn't take the time to be pressed by the Lord to really let go and to, to travail before him. Um, because that in, throughout this whole word, there was like, this is a posturing that requires our surrender. This is another line from your thing, right? And sacrificial obedience. That goes to a couple words that I had released before this even came out. I mean, like our words, like we're in the same lane, but we're not on the same path. We're looking at that diamond from two different perspectives, but Amy, they sync up so closely. Right. Um, and because the Lord had been working on you in this, I just had the opportunity to preach that, you know, we're coming into a season of brave, bold, sacrificial, radical obedience. Right. But, but this, this is what this word has to say about that. Um, and, and I think that, that we have to, and we, you both, you and I have been preaching this for a couple years now that we have to get our stuff right before the Lord. We are not a pure bride for the Lord to come back for and because we're still wanting to hold on to our stuff, our ways, our thinking, um, instead of really aligning ourselves with God's plans, God's timing. And we're looking at things from an earthly perspective. So I want to talk about this. I'm going to open that can of worms because you and I've been talking about this in private for a couple of years, but I want to talk about the wealth transfer because I loved 
this. You said many travailed over their heavenly wealth transfer, but you give examples. But I think people here in this earthly realm are not looking at the wealth transfer from a heavenly perspective. And you kind of just briefly mentioned, you know, Hannah was travailing and at this, this heavenly wealth transfer, but you also in this, you talked about Daniel and Jeremiah and Elijah and Jesus. And so let's kind of unpack that. I wasn't ready to go there today, but I guess we're going to go there. But let's talk about this wealth transfer and how there needs to be this paradigm or this mind shift from what people really think it's going to be. And I'm going to say this too. If you're not willing to go through the travail, if you're not willing to lay yourself on the altar, you're not going to be in any position to receive any kind of wealth transfer, whether it be monetarily or spiritual at all. So I'm just, I'm going to lay that out there. This is a, this, this is one of those buzzwords. I'm sorry, I'm getting on my soapbox, but this is one of those buzzwords, Amy, that drives me crazy when people talk about the wealth transfer, because that's why I haven't got there because then people are like, Oh, I like that ministry. They're talking and they're tickling my ears. I'm going to throw money at them. And that's really what they're doing because, because in order to position yourself for the wealth transfer, you have to do the travail. You have to be ready to walk through the threshold and the open door, but you got to do your part because scripture says, you know, um, that about being a good steward and being pressed down, shaking it together, overflowing. Well, if you're not a good steward, God's not going to channel anything through you. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to let, I'm going to let you get on your soapbox. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think the overarching issue is when we're talking about something very specific about this, I think it really, in a sense, highlights, um, the, um, mismanagement of true discipleship in the body of Christ, because we have stagnated people into an immature posture and way of thinking that everything about heaven translates into our earthly definitions and not the other way around. And we're not discipling people into an understanding of, um, you know, Lord, your will, be done here on earth as it is in heaven, not your will into my will of my earthly things. And so I think that really kind of is the big highlighter um, for me. And, and it really just kind of shatters my heart because I feel so many people are stagnated into an immature materialistic way of thinking mm -hmm. and, and that it's all about their life and their comforts and, and finances and da, 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 da. Do I think the wealth transfer has something to do with the Lord blessing his his people with finances and, and kingdom things? Yes, because he understands how we have to function as dual citizens, right? We're citizen of heaven, we're citizen of earth. And he understands how we have to function. But when our heart posture is for earthly things and we're not desiring kingdom things, it instantly disqualifies us in my book because we're not kingdom mindset. We are earthly comforts and, and there's a, a, a mismanagement even in our hearts before we have it in our hands. And I think when we look at things in a new covenant way, specifically about the wealth transfer, um, a lot of times we we tend to reference the Israelites in captivity and how they were weighed down with the wealth of Egypt and blah, 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 right? They wandered. They had to get Egypt out of them. I mean, we've all kind of heard those stories. I've even shared it a lot because I've had a lot of revelation with the Israelites and their journey and such. But several years ago, um, I kind of had this revelation and i think it really was a, that beginning shift that the lord was doing in me and my own heart and my own perspectives over my own prayer lists and desires and all of these things and it was the what if this new covenantal way of us surrendering our thoughts our hearts and everything to the lord what if He's getting all of our Egypt out of us before he weighs us down, right? Because what did, what did the Israelites do with that Egyptian gold? They melted it down and they created idols. Mm -hmm. And the Lord that we follow now in this new covenant, this redeemed way of life out of the law and, you know, what Jesus did for us, 
The Lord is not going to give us something that we are simply going to turn into idols. He is not going to entrust us with something that he knows full well. Our hearts are not purified in a way to steward that thing. And so when we work on our posturing and we let him talk to us, it's going to look different for all of us. It's how he's purifying us so that we will steward what he desires to do through us with absolute reverence and purity um, of what he's wanting to establish through us as kingdom stuff here on earth that he so desires to be done. And I think that's so good because I mean, you know, I've heard lots of people like, oh, well, maybe I'm going to, you know, God's just going to funnel all this money through me, but they're not good stewards of their own financial resources. And so why is God going to add more to it? Because we have to go through the purification process to make money, not be our idol. Right. Um, it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. It's not money itself. And so our perspective, our earthly perspective, look, money doesn't make us happy. God is but but it is what makes this us be able to function and, and do things in this world. And it's this economy and God knows that. So there are some people that are going to get this wealth transfer and it's going to be monetary, uh, monetary. But I loved what you said in the beginning where you were really talking about this heavenly wealth transfer and it's not monetary. It's, it's the Hannah's that are the travailing for the, the child that she wants. And so desperately, um, has been praying for years. I mean, she was being bullied by the other wife for years i mean talk about travail talk about having to carry this burden of i mean if you look at what scripture said and what they fully walk by children are a blessing of the lord so if your womb wasn't open the lord wasn't blessing you and and even in the temple when the priest came he was like why are you drunk and why are you in here? She's like, I'm not drunk. I'm not drunk, right? In fact, she she said, I'm here praying that God would give me a child. So much so that that child, Samuel, came back to serve under Eli, who called Hannah drunk. Yeah. Talk about posturing yourself to enter into that threshold. And I think that's a, I think as we're talking about this, it's a very beautiful and perfect picture mm -hmm. at how Hannah was not so anchored into the receipt of the promise that she wasn't willing to return it back to the Lord. Okay. She was not so, she was not that hoarder mentality. She knew her biggest desire she finally received and yet she gave it back to the Lord to do with it as he wished. And the wish for that child, A, it fulfilled her heart's desire for one, but two, he became a prophet to nations and his words never fell to the ground. Powerful, mm -hmm. powerful heavenly wealth transfer. Yeah. And see, that's, that's that picture that I think the Lord is really wanting us to grab a hold of. That yes, we can have these desires. Yes, I want to do this and I have this vision for this kingdom business. And that is not ill-placed. Okay. Right. So I just I want to encourage you and 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 those listening, that's your heart's desires are given by God. But are you so tethered to them that instead of them being altars in your temple, they have become idols? That's the differentiation between our our heart tether to earthly systems or our heart's desire for heavenly um plans and purpose yeah. and that is that purifying place that he has us that's in that sacrificial obedience that's what comes in the travail is a deeper understanding of heaven's purpose and the desires that heaven sets within us Mm -hmm. That's so good. And that's such a good point because I think it's so true that we, we have got to ask God for his mindset around this wealth transfer and take it out of our human earthly mindset and concept of what it is because wealth in the kingdom is so much more than finances. In fact, we don't, once we're in heaven, we don't actually need finances the way we need them here. We need other things. And you know, this is something too, like, like the, 
Lord has been talking to our family about. And so anybody that took the dream big, John kind of shared a little bit with that about what God was calling us into. And, and the Lord had asked me two years ago, are you, would you be willing to walk away from dare to hear ministry and the sound, the call and all this stuff? And I was like, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I will do this. If this is what you're calling our family to do for kingdom purposes, I'm willing to walk away. I'm willing to lay it down. And I was like, ready to do that. Right. Boom. Okay. I'm all in, I'm laying it all down. And then nothing happened for two years, but it's in that travail. It's in that process that the Lord is saying, okay, well, let's really work this out of you. And, you know, just recently I've had to like, like the Lord was saying, I need you to stop the remnant. That's the prophetic community that we're doing. Right. I need you to stop that. I was like, okay, Lord, but and I'm like all these ideas and all these things and all these comebacks with, okay, but I don't think you fully understand what this means. Right. And then I was reminded, am I willing to lay it down? Am I willing to sacrifice what I have in the moment for what the Lord is wanting to maybe transfer to me? And in, in that moment still, yes, Lord, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do it, praying into it. Am I making the right decision? Am I doing the right thing? I've journeyed with many of these people for two years and, and it's good and it feeds all of us. Right. But the Lord's like, I need you to lay it down for a season. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. And you know, when I obeyed that and the travail that went into that, like all of a sudden I'm still in the midst of doing it. We're not finished yet. I mean, we're going to finish, but it's not completely finished. It ends in March and then usually we just pick up and run right on with the next year. But the Lord asked me to lay it down for this summer season and, and possibly pick it up in the fall, still praying into that. So all of you that have been sending me emails about the remnant, it's on pause right now. But in that, even though I'm still in the middle of it, my willingness to lay it down on the altar, the Lord had like infused all these blueprints that had been tucked in these drawers of things that had been on my heart or I was stuck and I couldn't figure out how to make this piece do. I mean, the sound, the call thing, I started that an Instagram page for two years. I have like four pictures on that. And then I was like, I don't know what to do with this because I was so busy in the moment doing this other stuff and unwilling to like, I just didn't have enough time in the day. And, and I was like unwilling to let it go, but not really. And then what do I, but in that time when I made that decision and I made that announcement, the Lord just boom, poured out revelation and blueprints and plans. And so I want to encourage any of you, like, even though the Lord asked you to do something in the moment, like he did two years ago, I still haven't seen the fruition of our family walking out that kingdom business that God has given us, but plans are moving forward now in this season. And it's just taken two years for things to catch up, but God already had my heart. God already had the travail. I mean, and you would think that the part of yes, Lord would be the hard part. Mm -mm. It's been walking it out the last two years. And I think that's the other thing about, I thought it was interesting, Amy, the, the people that you chose to talk about Hannah and Daniel and Elijah and Jeremiah, because look at Daniel. I mean, he's brought in, he's a prisoner, he's a prisoner of war, um, but they put him in charge of all the stuff. Nebuchadnezzar, he's got favor on him for Nebuchadnezzar. And yet because he had integrity, because he was willing to travail, he interceded, he prayed, he was constantly in communion and communication with God. He had to suffer. I mean, he got thrown into the lion's den. Nebuchadnezzar didn't really want to do it, but he had to do it because, Hey, these are the rules of the land. And, um, and I'm looking at the things that he went through, even though he had favor and position, he still had to walk through this travail. He still had to walk through this positioning and getting his heart right, even though he was Daniel, but he still had, he had to put the main thing. He had to walk it out. Mm -hmm. He had to walk it out. So let's, um, any, any final comments on that part? Yeah, it's, it's a picture of our, um, sacrificial obedience right? Like, Lord, I'm going to be faithful to you and what you've called me into, no matter what it looks like. Mm. And it was never a, a, a looking like comfort and accolades and masses of people cheering you on. It never was that way. And I think we, that's another earthly humanistic definition that we put on, on the call of God on our lives. And, you know, in my more immature days, 
I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I had that perspective, you know, and, and, and the Lord has really wrestled that out of me mm-hmm. and, and how beautiful and grateful I am to see the stories that we read about in the scriptures, because it really shows us this is what it really looks like. I mean, from Old Testament to new, you know, I mean, all of the Acts church, they counted it all as joy. They were obedient. They went out. Yes, signs, ones and wonders and miracles followed them. But so did the persecution and the certain death. And they counted that as joy because they knew they were living and walking as Jesus walked. And that's really the call on our lives. Mm -hmm. So my sacrificial obedience, if it lands me in a lion's den, I'm doing what I'm called to do. I'm not here for comfort with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, their private obedience to God was then put on display. The whole, the crowds came to watch them be martyred, right? That's what they wanted to see. They didn't want to see what they were doing behind closed doors, you know? And, and so, their obedience walked them into a fiery furnace but we all know the story the heat was cranked up it killed the poor guy that had to turn the heat up standing outside the thing and yet they walked in and the witness of them being completely unbound the fourth man in the fire the king saw the crowd saw i mean the the story was god's not theirs the glory was god's not theirs and i think this is part of that separation in that sacrificial obedience that comes when you're going if i have to suffer my whole life for you to get the glory then so be it it's your story god and so whatever that looks like the war at the threshold you know whatever it may be i'm trusting that you're ordering my steps lord and i'm asking for your help for me to be willing to continually be sacrificially obedient in my walk towards you yeah that's so good and and i think I think when people heard like 5784 is the year of the open door. I mean, I did. Okay. I'm not just saying other people. I'm like, finally, finally the doors open. I mean, I was like, yes, yes. Finally me running up against the wall. Like where's the door? I mean, I had somebody give me a word. I don't know, years ago at a pastor's conference, I was walking down, you know, usually I'm giving them words, but they gave me this word. And he's like, I see you and you're in the port and you're walking and and you're in the boat and, and you're, you're taking the boat out to sea, but you haven't been able to find the opening in the seawall. I'm like, yeah, no kidding. I keep saying I'm running into a wall, but I didn't know I was in the ocean. But to me, oceans represent God's vast plans and purposes. So this guy was totally like the Holy Spirit was totally moving through him to speak my language. And I was like, yes, finally, I get to go out into the open sea. I finally get out of the small confines of the harbor and I get to get out there. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. It took so many years, even beyond that. Like I'm just now starting to feel that. And so we think, oh, it's the season of the open door. Finally, everything is going to come through Mm -mm. the war, the war, the war, at the threshold, like this dream that the Lord gave you in the last part of this word. Like, I don't want, I don't want to end this podcast episode without talking about it because I think it's so important for us to understand that, that there is a war, there is a real battle. You have a real enemy that is seeking to destroy you, to kill you, to take you out. And he comes in the most subtle of moments. I talked about this on the podcast episode about remembrance and about my story, about how I was wrestling with the the concept of, well, how is this different than the vision board? And I just did dreaming big with God. How did I did this seminar? And so how is this different? And I was like calling my people and talking to my people. And then even after I said, okay, I'm in, I'm going to do this and being obedient to the Lord. Can I tell you that the enemy has been relentless, Mm -hmm. like relentless, like even though like last night, Amy in, in, stepping forward. It was like, I'm fine during the day. I'm so excited. I get all this confirmation of, yeah, you're supposed to be doing this remembrance workshop. And then I lay my head down at night and the enemy comes in just like he did in the garden of Eden. And he's like, are you sure? 
are people really going to come? Is that really a thing? Like it was like all this stuff. And I was like, Ugh. and I'm battling, I'm battling to cross over this threshold in this season for these new things and this new way that God has given me to do some stuff. And I'm telling you the battle and the war for the threshold and to walk through open doors is real. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, I think that's, this is one of those subjects that people just kind of tune out, you know, they want the fluffy feel good stuff, but you know, it's the David is Ziklag, right? Everybody loves that story because David encouraged himself in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord and the Lord told him to recover all, but what did go to recover all mean? It means you had to go back to war. He and his men just returned from war. They were victorious in that battle and they were, plundered right yay i get to recover all oh but wait you got to go back to war and and this is something that i think we have to just settle in ourselves that the enemy um the enemy in general and and for the rest of our time here right he will never wave the white flag Mm -hmm. never ever ever or is the enemy going to leave you alone does he have access to you no not if you keep those access points closed right right? but there will always be scheming that the enemy is having around you there will always be that sniper up in the tree or down in the bushes there will always be that cannon fire that tries to come in and blow up your life There will always be battles that are going to rage against you. And I think if anybody is telling you otherwise, then they're misleading you. Right. And, and I'm not a doom and gloom person. I am a very positive person. Actually, I would love to dole out cotton candy, but it's not in me. Right. It's not my lane. And, And my lane is being very honest and real about walking with the Lord and what that really looks like walking in the fullness thereof. And it is, it is glorious and is victorious and it is wonderful. And yes, it is difficult. And I had a word, I was on a broadcast, um, I can't remember when it was, but this phrase kept coming out is getting, you know, get used to um, being in your battle fatigues. You know, it, we're, we just need to reconcile in our spirit that there is always going to be contention in things of the spirit. Do we get caught up in second heaven stuff? No, that's not our job. But what we do need to understand is the the absolute value and importance of the call on our lives. Every single one of us is of high value and high importance, which is why the enemy is constantly throwing cannon fire at you. He wants to stop you. He wants to slow you down. And I do not like giving play by plays of the enemy. That's not my favorite thing but we have to recognize the truth of it okay and and we have to also recognize the truth of who we are and that we are always battling from victory not for victory it's already ours but we have to have the stamina and the determination to go okay i know i'm already victorious i have to walk through this battlefield it is difficult i will not get um taken out by some hidden landmine that's not the lord's call on my life you know those kinds of things that you have to kind of remind yourself there's always going to be war at this threshold because the value of heaven within me is worth it Mm -hmm. and so that is kind of the mindset that we have to have that no matter whatever is trying to come and take me out it can't yeah yeah, that's so that's so good, and and I love that. I love that. I there was years ago somebody had perf- um, painted this prophetic painting of um, the bottom of a bride and her dress and in one foot she had the beautiful slipper it was so beautiful and then the other foot combat boots and yeah. I was like I wanted that I wanted that painting so much but we were not in a place where we could afford what they were selling it for but it was just like but that's the picture that we need as the bride of christ like you've got you've got your 
battle fatigues on. You even talked about this. You said, if we do not armor up and war, we will not be able to withstand what is to come, nor will we be able to steward what heaven desires to bestow on us. And so we have to have one foot prepared and ready to go to the party. And we have to have one ready to do war because it is a simultaneous thing. It's like when Nehemiah was building the wall, right? He was building the wall and they had a sword in one hand and they were working with the other. And it, this is, this is the, the dichotomy of the kingdom, I think, right. That this paradigm shift that we have to, is all going to be all great. And we're just going to be able to get in there. Doors are going to fly open yet. Some doors may fly open, but you better be praying about what doors open. And if you're supposed to be walking through them. Right. Um, but we also have to battle for the doors that we're really supposed to walk through. Um, Amy, this word threshold was so good. And I'm so glad I know that it's been about six months since you've released this, but we were done. We were done kind of recording our stuff. Um, and then we went into the holidays and then you know, I got sick and here we are um, in March. And this is so powerful. And I think it's so good because I, I think we don't revisit. I don't think we go back and remember what the Lord spoke to us. And then we get in the midst of the season going, what's going on. And he already spoke it to us. He already spoke to us about this posturing, this positioning ourselves, getting ourselves clean, getting ourselves purified. I love this. Cause as I was reading through this, of course, you know, it's so great. Cause like you, this word came out and then my word came out and then your part two came out. And there was this one word at the very end that the Lord, and, and it was just kind of like this side thing in mine and it kind of is in yours too but there's something on this word and it's that word joy and and you had it in here you said um that we need to count it as joy like all of the stuff that's coming out we're in a revolutionary war the revelation pouring from heaven and bursting out from our spirit man and a bold and brave company of believers counting every tack every blessing every shot from the enemy's count camp counting it as joy and the lord said that in this season in the word that he gave me about the remember recover restore was that we really will truly begin to understand what it means to have the joy of the Lord be our strength and that the enemy that we allow the enemy to come rob us of our joy in the midst of these difficult moments of battle. When in fact we should be doing what Isaiah 54 says about single barren woman. And ha because you have victory before you even get it, stretch your tent pegs and do all this. And, and that we have to have that joy of the Lord be our strength, even in the most of difficult circumstances that we need to count it as joy. So any thoughts on that? I know that was just kind of like this short little boom in there, but there's something on that word for this year, I think. Yeah, it's, it's important. And I think it's imperative that we remember that it's our circumstances that bring momentary places of happiness, but it's the joy of the Lord that strengthen us in the midst of maybe not so great circumstances. Right. Um, and I think the, the remembrance thing, um, that you're, that you're talking about, um, it's a really beautiful cross pollinator into what is to come. We have to have the remembrance in order to walk forward. There's it's, it's almost fuel for the fire. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful thing. And we, it, it really is how we walk into all of this stuff, right? It's, it's his joy. It's his strength. It has nothing to do with us and remembering everything that he has done is a reminder that he is still doing it. And it is a reminder <laughs> and a forward look that he will continue to do. Yeah. Right. Cause he's the same yesterday, today and forever. Yeah. And what he speaks remains. He just unfolds all of the different layers and, and it's our joy to get to uncover that and our joy to walk as Jesus walked. We are to be that continuation of the Acts church because the Acts church is exactly how we should have been living for a millennia. Right. But we won't go on that soapbox, but it's been deterred and it's been disrupted. And I really believe that we are in a moment of time um, that the Lord is like, finally, my remnant gets it. And we are re reinstating in a way of how we walk and how we live. 
those people that we read about in Acts and forward, they turned the world upside down. But how did they do that? They did it in the face of persecution. And the majority of the persecution came from the religious establishment. Let's not forget that. Okay. And, and it came in the face of, you know, the ruling law of the land um, in, in certain aspects and in certain uh, territories that they stepped into. But every point of persecution and difficulty that they faced, they were ridiculously excited about it because to them, the persecution was confirmation to their obedience. Mm. And I think if we have that perspective as we walk through this and the humility to do that, right? Because we can't have rebellion come in, right? There's a balance here. But when we look at it that way, the things that come up against us is this persecution or is this consequences from disobedience or my rebellion? I mean, this is a discerning moment, right? We talk about discernment a lot, but to count it all as joy and to look at it as my persecution levels are really a confirmation to my obedience. I think that should be a, a fuel for the fire for many of us. Right. When you know you're taking land in a battle, you fight harder. You almost have this adrenaline rush of, oh, we've almost overtaken the enemy. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And I think that's kind of where we need to shift instead of going, oh, I'm so tired. And we're just we've lost so many people. And I mean, the doom and gloom side of war. Right. But if we're like, we've almost taken back the territory let that be that injector and, um, and look at all of it and count it all as joy. Yeah. That's so good. That's so good. Well, there is a lot to unpack in this. And I'm sure that as you were reading it, different people were hearing different things. And so how can they find you? Like what's your website? Where can they go? I'll obviously put the direct link in the show notes, but if they're wanting to check out about you, if they want to sew into your ministry, um, how do they find you, Amy? Um, just go to the website. It's raw and real ministries, all spelled out, um, dot com. And it's got all of my social links and all the blog entries and all that stuff. It's all just right there. That's the simplest way. Awesome. Well, I love that. There's so much more that we can unpack, but we actually have yeah. a two next week that we're going to talk about the second part of the word that the Lord gave you, um, about the Psalm 24 season. And so we're going to come back with that, but I'm just wondering if you want to just declare or pray us out today based on some of the things that we talked about, like the threshold and the war or whatever the Lord's put on your heart. I want to just give you the last few minutes. If there's anything else that's on your heart that you want to say about this word, I'm going to give that minute to you. And then I'll just like close us out of the podcast today. Absolutely. Yeah. Lord, I just thank you for this moment of time. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your invitation into your presence, Lord. And I just ask that you continue to um, soften our hearts um, into a place of desired repositioning um, and just giving us the eyes to see um, maybe even the things that we don't want to see, Lord. Like, may we be bold and brave to look at those things. May we be bold and brave to hear the things that maybe we don't want to hear because maybe we don't think it's going to feel good. But Lord, I thank you for the invitation, the constant passionate pursuit that you have for us and the call that you've placed on our lives, Lord, that you passionately pursue us and pull us into your presence. And Lord, I just thank you for all of the hearts that are reevaluating and re-looking at things that have been going on and that they too begin to shift the narrative of their mindsets and of their heart position, Lord, that they begin to look at the call in your life and all the adversity that's come up against them, that we find that way to count it all as joy. Lord, may we continue to reside in your presence at your feet, surrendered and postured for you to move through us as you so desire in this moment of time, Lord. We just thank you and we praise you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, Amy, thank you for coming on and sharing this word and for just uh, for the time that you spend with the Lord to really hear, to really posture yourself, to bring us this powerful, powerful word. So thank you for that. 
Thank you for having me. Always. <laughs> Always a pleasure to have you. So, well, thank you for listening to Dare to Hear the podcast, where we encourage you to dare to hear the voice of God. I'm Debbie Ketterman. If you've been blessed at all in any way, we're going to ask that you do a couple of things. Share, share, share this podcast episode out. Go to Amy's website. Uh, check out this word, print it out and put it before you and ask the Lord, what is it and where am I at in this season with this word? And what do you require of me for stepping into this next season? And then also go check out the Remembrance Workshop and any of you that are kingdom entrepreneurs, authors, product developers, go check out my ready to launch uh, three day event that I have coming up in June. You don't want to miss that. Even if you're not quite ready to launch, this is going to set you up for success. It's never too early to plan ahead. So do that. But I'm really excited about the Remembrance Workshop. And um, I have some different speakers than before. Amy's son is graduating. Um, from college. So she was a little preoccupied that weekend, but don't worry. She'll be back on another one of my things um, in the near future, but go check that out because right now we're in early bird pricing. So until next week, when Amy and I come back to share the second part of that word, have a blessed week. God bless you and goodbye. Cause